Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Julie Coleman. I'm your graduate speaker series coordinator, and I'm here with Sam Johnson, who's been helping me out. Um, and he's our oncoming coordinator. Um, we're very excited to have Patricia here today and hear from her. Um, just a couple of house for all of you in person. Um, if you're here to get credit, we have the Slido code up on the wall. So just make sure you sign up um, and put in your name and all that. Um, it's my job to introduce Dave Evans. Uh, Dave Evans is our associate professor of practice. He um, has been in the department since 2012 after leaving the practice of 37 years where he worked in California, Ohio, and New England. Um, Dave is our contact person for ASLA and um, he teaches the foundational design studios. He's a very good friend of Pat Patricia and so I'm gonna turn it over to him to introduce her. Thank you, Julie. Yes. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to actually get up here and introduce a friend of mine. Patricia is the founding principal of Base Landscape Architecture. And I was there before BASE existed even. Uh, Patricia's partner, Andreas, was a good friend of mine and I came to know Patricia in those days. And since that time, BASE has won numerous design awards and has really blossomed into an outstanding landscape architecture firm, I think. I'm glad to see my friend David Bell here with us today because Back in 2013, Dave and I took 25 LAEP students to California. And we visited a number of firms while we were there. And one day we went over to Berkeley to visit Pete Walker and Partners, which is, you know, a renowned, I mean, Pete Walker is one of the probably best known landscape architects in the world working today. And, you know, Pete, as you can imagine, has a very nice office in a renovated warehouse and so forth. But right across the street was Patricia and my friend Andreas, where Base Landscape Architect was housed in this somewhat abandoned house with wooden boards over the windows and that sort of thing. So, you know, I mean, here was a real startup, you know, if you know what I mean. And I think Andreas had somehow got this place rent free. I think the owner didn't want anybody to burn it down. So he said, you can have it until I'm ready to do something with it. So it was quite a paradox, really. We went to visit P. Walker and Partners, which is a very slick, you know, well-appointed firm. And then we walked across the street to visit Andreas and Patricia and, uh, you know, in this sort of boarded over house. So it's wonderful to think about where you began and all that you've accomplished. I mean, I could begin to list the awards they've won, the ASLA awards, the San Francisco Beautification Awards and so forth, but I have a feeling those will come up, perhaps some of them in, the, in your presentation today. But it's just wonderful to have you here, Patricia. I'm so glad to see you. And all these years later now to see your great success, so. Please welcome Patricia Algara to our. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is really wonderful to be here. And Dave, what a beautiful introduction. It has, it has been a journey. Mm -hmm. It has been a journey and base is turning 10 this year, mm -hmm. so. You know, we're no longer the uh, crazy renegade startup that we were. We're a little bit more starting to be more, um, you know, before we become preteens. <laughs> so <laughs> we're well behaved right now. Uh, but it's really wonderful to be here and, and talk to you about my love and passion, which is bees and pollinators. And so I'm truly honored to to be invited and to tell you about this and this great speaker series. Um, do I need to point to a different? Got it. And to all the people on Zoom, hi. Thanks for joining us. 
thank you. So yes, my love for for pollinators and for bees, and um, it's always magical to be invited to speak about something that you love so much and to to know that others have an interest to listen to it. So I'm going to start by telling you just a little bit about me, about who I am and how I came to love this beautiful insect so much. So that's me up there mm. and my brother, my mom, and this is my grandfather. So I grew up in central Mexico, San Luis Potosí. My grandfather, Ramon, my mother's father was a farmer. He had a beautiful farm, little farm, not a big farmer, just a little tiny family farm. But I got the incredible experience to be able to spend a lot of my childhood there with my hands on the earth and you know building dams on the watering canals. And, um, and it was really a truly formative experience for me because I was able to harvest tomatoes freshly ripened from the vine and fruits and experience that flavor, right? That juiciness of a ripened fruit from the sun and milk the cows. We had fresh milk every night. It was really great. And this down here, it's me planting a tree on the median in front of my house in Mexico with my father. So that's how it started. <laughs> My father was an architect, so up there, I'm there with my, in one of my dad's um, construction sites. So I did spend a lot of time going to construction sites and seeing, you know, things come to life. My father's father was a grand, uh, an architect also, and this is some of his work. He built the school that I went to school at, and it was, it was really beautiful school. And I think it, it you know, it's the other influence of, of my, um, experience and my love for designing spaces. I think that the spaces that we inhabit really form who we are and our experience and having, having beautiful spaces really influence how we experience the world, how we relate to others. So I'm grateful for, for both my grandfathers for giving me the love for the built environment and the love for, for the earth and for the, the sunshine and the fresh food. And I feel like I'm a, that I found landscape architecture years later. And it's a good merging of, of both of those uh, backgrounds. So as I mentioned, you know, like this, this love and this passion really has influenced my, my, prof my professional career in creating spaces that focus on creating um, edible spaces for children, for children to be able to experience how to grow food, how to taste food, how to put their hands on the earth, how to have that in the built environment, especially in the cities where um, even if you go to the park, parents don't let their kids put their hand on the dirt because there's dog poop and there's needles in San Francisco, you know, it's, it's nasty. And so you don't get that experience as a kid. And so it's important that we give kids that experience and that experience, the best place for them to have it is in schools because it's where they spend most of their life. And how do we give them also the ownership of creating those spaces and designing those spaces and feeling like they have an influence in that. And maybe it will spark their curiosity and think about this profession as something that they might wanna do as you know, do themselves. So our practice is really focused on that, creating healthy habitat for educational spaces, spaces mostly for children and helping them see that experience. Um, so this is just some examples. This was the, uh, the first project that we did as BASE, which really marked and influenced our trajectory as a firm, the Children Museum of Sonoma County, which is all about the experience of kids in the transect of Sonoma County, which is about this river, the Russian River running through the county, providing the water for agriculture and the importance of pollinators as they move through the space for the agriculture of that county and, you know, in general. But the story is about this, this butterfly and how it goes from the egg to the, um, the pupa and then the, um, chrysalis and then it emerges as a butterfly. 
in that experience and how you know that transformative that is and now we're looking more about just the in general the built environment right the urban environment how can we really push for creating healthy habitat on every corner that we have and looking at medians looking at the front of houses like every little space rather than having it be lawn or, or something that's not productive can we look at spaces with a completely different lens as being healthy habitat capturing the water reusing it having permeability and really you know allowing for this living environment to be part of our urban living environment. So I'll tell you now about bees. And there's so much that I have to talk about bees. I love bees. Um, there's so much magic in the bee world and the beautiful connection between bees and plants and that pollination that make our food it's really a magical love story. And there's so much that I could say about that, but I would try to keep it uh, short and sweet for this time that we have together. But, you know, it's, if you look at it, it's like every place you look within the bees and the plants, there's always a love message of how they want to connect with us, how they're connected to us, how we're connected to them, how we're, you know, part of the, this living environment and how we're one together. So this is, a, you know, telling you this beauty of it, but also the, the challenges that we're facing today. And there is a quote by E.O. Wilson. If all of mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equi equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. So this is important, right? We are losing our insects at an incredible rate. Not just bees, you probably heard about honeybees, honeybee collapse, et cetera. But it's not just the bees, it's all insects. And, and this is happening within our lifetime. This is not something that's been happening for a long time. Within our lifetime, the collapse has increased dramatically, right? So um, there was a research that was done. It started by a very non-scientific way in which um, people started observing that when you go on a road trip, and you may remember this when you were kids, you go on a road trip and you get to your destination and the windshield is covered in bugs, right? And you have to clean the windshield. And now it's like, you know, there's maybe like a couple bugs in the windshield. You probably noticed this. And so this group of German scientists really looked into that and were like, what, what's going on? Like, what is really going on with this? And so they started um, global monitoring. And uh, according to this global monitoring data, they found that 500 of, of 500 species that they had been following, there was a 45% decline in those species of invertebrates over the past 40 years. So again, this is within our lifetime, right? The German study found that 75% 70, of the insect biomass had disappeared in 63 protected areas that they had been studying and following. In Puerto Rico, a different study found that there was a 60-fold loss of biomass, meaning that when they did their um, experiments with catching with the net catching insects, they used to be able to catch about 500 milligrams of insects to take back to the lab and you know find out what they were, and now they were only getting about eight milligrams. So 60%, you know, 60 fold. The um, Western monarch butterfly picture here, very iconic, beautiful butterfly that migrates from Canada to Mexico, the one in Western that passes through um, California that I see the most has, is on a 
99.9% decline on the count that they did this year. 99.9% monarchs, Western monarchs have disappeared. And that happened, that's from a, since they've been counting from the 1980s. So that's within our lifetime. We're losing this beautiful species. We're losing, of course, you've heard about the honeybees disappearing, but it's not just the honeybees, right? There's the 58% of native North American, North, Amer North American bees, which there's about 4,000 species of native bees that you may know or not know, but the, the bumblebee is one of th that you probably have seen. And the bumblebee, the rusty patch bumblebee also has an 87% decline. So we have had a loss of 900 million individual insects. 40% of the pollinators globally have gone into extinction in the next, will go into decline and extinction in the next couple of decades. So, you know, it's just, this, is, this is big. It's like we're losing our insects. And I think that, you know, there's so many things that are very pertinent right now in our lifetime and important and, and things that are changing so much, right? This, this pandemic is one of them that has made us all look at things very differently. And one of the reasons why this may have happened, right? It's because of the loss of habitat and the importance of really preserving that habitat for the species so that they have their space and, and we don't lose them. So um, how many insects are there in this world? Do we know how many species? Anyone? Wild guess? What? Two billion. So scientists have identified over a million species of insects. But they believe that we have only know about 20% of them. So. There's a lot of insects, a lot of insects. And we know very little about them. So how many insects, right? If we think about the biomass of the world, um, how much space do insects take? So it's mostly plants, right? Great plant friends. And then out of the uh, animal world, which is this little triangle, this, red part, the anthropods are, are insects. So imagine that compared to humans, all seven billion of us, it's much, much, much larger compared to all of the wild mammals in the world. The insect world is significant. It occupies a big part of the space, right? It is, um, you know, like I said, one million species have been identified and that's compared to about maybe 6,000 mammals and maybe 8,000 birds, more or less. Insects contain about three times as much as the mass of humans. And, you know, just to give you an idea of who they are, as we know that 20%, there's about 12,000 species of ants in the world that we know about. There's about 20,000 species of bees. Honeybee is one species. There's about 40,000 species of beetles, right? There's so many that we don't know. And they're all disappearing. They're all disappearing. So many species that we don't even know they're disappearing because we don't know them, but they're all disappearing. And, you know, why is this important that they're disappearing? Well, a big part of it, like I mentioned, right, is our food. We depend on them. Our food production, Without insects, we're going to be eating very, very bland and not very nutritious meals. So we need insects to give us the rich vitamin source of fruits and vegetables that we depend on to be healthy. Bee pollination all right, makes about three quarters of our food possible. And they are an environmental service that's worth $500 billion every year in 
the commercial beekeeping pollination that is taken to different farms to make pollination possible. So they're great allies of ours. 90% of all flowers in the world are pollinated by insects and bees. The uh, dung beetle, which you may be familiar with, but you may not, but also it's a great um, service to ranchers because they collect a lot of the dung and they clean it up and they save ranchers about $38 million a year in their service that you may not even notice or knew about. So they're a really a vital ecological service to our planet. They do so much. They do so much, right? They, they decompose, they, they break down and decompose all the nutrients that make it possible for the plant world to take in and have a photosynthesis. They, they decompose organic waste. They feed most birds and bats. So the insect disappearance is not just bad for our own food, but it's also really bad for the food of other animals, the birds and the insects that feed on them, right? So it's a real threat to our ecosystem. It really is a threat of starvation. So, you know, I don't want to scare you, but. You're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> but it's bad. And, and, you know, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why are we allowing this to happen in our beautiful, precious earth? that this species that we need so much are disappearing, what's happening? So a big part of it, right, is habitat loss. We have lost so much habitat to urbanization and to agriculture intensification, right? And, and pollution, pollution of systemic pesticides, mostly in fertilizers. So this map over here, you know, it's an exaggerated map, of course, but here's the United States with the migration path of many of our pollinator friends, the monarch migration, the hummingbird, the bats. And we were talking about this this morning in studio, right? Birds, like you guys have a, an, an amazing amount of birds that migrate through Salt Lake and go to Salt Lake City. And, and your environment is a big part of that bird population. And this is, of course, an exaggeration, but it's a, you know, quite accurate of all the different monoculture regions across our country, right? So there's, there's corn, there's apples and cherries, there's melons, there's blueberries, there's canola, sunflowers, there's almonds in California, apples. And these monocultures, right, we used to think that oh, well, you know, the cities are terrible, but out in the country, animals and the country is beautiful and species live free. Not so much with this intensification of agriculture where we have monocultures that are being sprayed with herbicides, with pesticides, and that really don't provide any, they're food deserts for pollinators. So as species are flying through this large stretches of land, they're unable to find food source unless it's the particular time when that particular monoculture is blooming. But in the case of California, which is the one I know the most, the almonds, you know, they bloom from, for three weeks. And out of those three weeks, it's a food desert for all insects. So bees cannot survive there. They have to truck, truck them to pollinate these almonds. Otherwise, they cannot be pollinated because there's no insects there. Um, so that's you know, a, big, a big part of the problem that we have here. Other factors are biological factors like pathogens, invasive species taking over the place of 
um, our local native species. And then of course, climate change, right? Where we have drought, which is changing the environment, fires, um, storms, you know, we're experiencing so many changes with climate change and that's changing the environment, the local environment, how, how things that we used to know are no longer as they were. So how do we, you know, how do we solve this? What do we do? How do we get there? And so I think that it all starts by having some interest. And I'm hoping that today I'm, I'm starting to pique your interest. This is important, that you should look into it and that you start tracking it, right? Maybe you don't believe anything I'm saying here, but you start maybe being like, well, maybe, let me look into that. And this, was it true what she said? Let me check it out. And you start tracking it and you start seeing it more in the news because now you're paying attention and your awareness then becomes more focused on this issue. And then you start being concerned about like, mm, yeah, this is, this is happening, what can we do? And then you start thinking about what can we do? What is the action item that we can do? And um, this is my first swarm at my urban farm in Berkeley. It was very exciting to have that first moment of connecting with the bees and feeling them. And they're so warm and fuzzy. <laughs> They're beautiful. You just can't help but fall in love with them. There's another beekeeper here who can probably relate to this beautiful experience of that connection with bees. And that for me was the moment that I was like, wow, this is, this is a beautiful living being. And it's not the individual bee, it's the hive being, the intelligence of the hive being that is interconnected yes 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 it's amazing it's like yeah it's a buzz they're all buzzing and they're warm and they're like hairy and it's it's, it's beautiful <laughs> yes um so that was a moment for me and the reason why i got bees is because i had this um urban farm i started an urban farm in berkeley around 2008, after, after I graduated from landscape architecture. And I started working at a firm and I was like doing cat all day. And I was like, it's not what I had in mind for my life. I was imagining more being out in the field and wanting to have that connection with, with growing food and feeling the earth. So I started this farm, there was a vacant land nearby and we were growing food, it was amazing. And then it was just, the time around colony collapse and just kept hearing about this colony collapse. And then I started having dreams about bees and bees, bees were just like, and I was like, okay, I know nothing about bees, but I'm gonna get some bees and figure out what to do. So I connected with someone who got me a hive and ta -da, I had bees. And I was like, ah, I don't know nothing about bees. How do you take care of this? friends. So those first years, right, was just all about learning about the bees. Like, how do you identify the queen? Here's the queen right here. How do you identify the drones? What's going on in the different seasons? How is a, you know, lungstrom hive, which is the more traditional one, square, different than the top bar hive, different from, a, you know, hive that's built more in the organic shape. How do bees build when they don't have the squares, they're more organic form. How do they communicate? How do they relate? Like I, I knew nothing. I had, there was so much for me to learn and I was very excited to start learning about bees and learning how to take care of them and what they needed and you know, when, to, when to do things, when to make more space for them, when to make it smaller. And then I started learning all about the products of the hive. Right? We all know about the honey, which is amazing, but there's pollen and there's propolis and there's wax and there's just so much medicine in the hive. And there's bee venom, which is incredibly medicinal as well. And I got really into just learning how to make the potions and the soaps and like still to this day, like I make my own deodorant and it's, it's just like a really beautiful relationship right that that I get to use these products for my bees 
and, and have that connection with them. And then I started learning more about the native bees, right? Because those are all honeybees and they're beautiful, but there's so many bees. Like I told you, there's 20,000 species of native bees, 4,000 of them in the US. In California, in this area, there's um, the highest diversity of bees that has been found in the US in this area near Pinnacles, which is like sort of south of San Francisco. And uh, Berkeley Bee Lab offer this class where you can go and do bee camp. And I was like, I'll sign up for bee camp. That sounds cool. So we went to do bee camp with some scientists from Berkeley Bee Lab and learned all about the different types of bees and how to identify them and how to look at them in the microscope. And then, you know, how do you start to know which is which, which flower they go. They all go to different flowers. They all have different flight patterns. They all have different ways to communicate. The flowers have different ways to provide the nectar for the different bees. It's really a magical world how the bees and the flowers communicate. So here's just some examples about the diversity of honeybees, right? And that bee, like that blue bee, it's just amazing. Like metallic blue bees, they're incredible. And in this picture, you can see like a big carpenter bee and a smaller native bee, sweat bees. And they all, you know, kind of go to the, 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 the flowers and they work better for pollination when you have a diversity of bees pollinating together. And then I really got interested on the more um, spiritual aspect of bees. Like bees have been part of cultures, different cultures for millennia. They have been introduced and part of the mythology of different cultures. So this over here, this is a honeycomb for, from the melipona stingless bees in Yucatan. So the melipona bees are stingless bees they make their honey in like little honey pots. This is actually just for their larva. They make very little honey. This honey is honey that they have collected from, from orchids, from vanilla. It's very specific, like very you know, high vibration. And they make very little honey, but it's extremely medicinal. The Mayas used it topically in their eyes to heal cataracts. Um, it's very good for healing wounds. Um, all kinds of medicine has been used. And this is the Mayan god, Amesun Kab, with his little honeycomb. And there is a place in the Yucatan Koba where the pyramid is exactly that pyramid and is the site for Amesun Kab, the bee god. So it's the, the shape of the form of this pyramid is taken after the bees. So the connection with the bee world it was very important for the Mayas. They you know, see them as part of the cosmology that created their world universe. Uh, this over here is in, in um, Crete, so part of the Mycenaean culture. This little golden pin was found from 4,000 years ago. I mean, it's amazing truly amazing. And again, right, they have these little um, sites built like honeycombs and it's believed that this was some matriarch society that worshiped bees and the bees were a big part of their mythology and that this was how they connected. This is Delphi and this is the Omphalo, which in the Greek mythology, the Omphalo is the center of the universe. Again, a honeycomb with little bees, which is the center of the universe. This is where the, the Oracle of Delphi, right here, this is Delphi. And the Oracle of Delphi had the Omphalos, and this is where women went and were entered into some sort of trance in which they were able to be an oracle and decipher. You know, people came with questions and asked them, and and it was a big part of the tradition, right? Honoring this this sacred place and the sacred place that bees played in their mythological, um, you know, culture and expression. 
in Egypt, right, also you have the, the tears of Ra, which is honey, and they're depicted in a lot of the hieroglyphs. They are also, the honey was found in the tombs, still good, you know, from thousands of years old, and the honey's still good. It does not go bad. It's amazing. King taught honey in his tombs. Incredible. And this is me and my friend Allison also capturing a hive there and just learning about the symbology also of, of bees in, in the Hawaiian culture. And just in, like, you know, like a, a lot of different places have this connection with bees and seeing them as, as sacred beings because of that connection that they give us so much. They give us so much. They give us the food that we need to live. We need to honor them and worship them. And here we have Inthai. Maybe there's something there because I can't forward. Yep, there we go. So now what is happening today? We went from you know, a tradition in which we honored and worshiped bees and saw them as sacred beings. And now they're being trucked, right? We need them, we need them for pollination. And so they're being trucked across the country in this migration to all the monoculture fields because we need them for pollination. And so about 95% of bees are being trucked around the country, commercial bees. And that's how you know bees are treated today. We have lost that, that connection with them. So this was me and a group of other women. We went and we walked amongst the almond fields to just be with, this is during the pollination of the, of the bees where most of the commercial bees are in this almond fields. And we just walked for days and sung songs to the bees to try to raise awareness through artivism about that connection with the sacred beings and how we've lost it. And we talked to the beekeepers and we talked to the farm owners and we looked at like, you know, how can we, how can we make, how can we bring balance to this? Like we have gone off too far from the pendulum. How can we have bees live here year round so we don't have to truck them? How can we create maybe buffer zones around the farms so that the bees can, can be there year round, right? and other bees can be there and other species can be there. And this doesn't become a monoculture. So that had been, you know, my conundrum as to like, what to do with this bees? How, how to help this bees? What can I do? What can I do to help this dear friend of mine that have helped us and given us so much? So this idea came to me about creating a nonprofit with Honey in the Heart. And with Honey in the Heart is fully dedicated to education, advocacy, and creating healthy habitats for pollinators. And it, you know, this is just an example of the education. And I go to speak to anyone who would listen to me. Thank you for inviting me and speak, hear me talk about bees. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, but talk to anyone, right? I just talk to people about bees because they're so important and it's so important that we learn more about bees. And we try to do it from a place and approach of, of art and making it, making it beautiful, maybe making people connect to that beauty, that, that love relationship that plants and bees and pollinators have and the, the beauty in it. So this is an example of a project that we did in San Francisco. This is the Pollinator Boulevard. Um, this is the city of San Francisco right here, 49 miles. This is the Pollinator Boulevard, is Dolores Street, which is right across from Market Street right here. Market Street is probably the main street in San Francisco that crosses the transect of the grid. And then Dolores is another one of the main streets where the Mission Dolores was where, you know, the, the Spanish um, started the, the city as is known today. So during the, I think it was nine, 2004 drought, 
the city of San Francisco decided that they were not going to irrigate anymore any places that were not used recreational. So if it was park and a soccer field, they'll keep irrigating. But if it's not, they'll stop irrigating. So this median, which is a long stretch along you know, one of the main streets in San Francisco, was all dry and looking really sad. And so I called the city and I said, you know, can we do something different? And they're like, well, like, like what? I'm like, well, we remove that turf and we put some um, drought tolerant pollinator habitat for the bees. And they said, well, yeah, we're open to those ideas. The city does want to stop irrigating, but it's all on you. You have to figure out how to do it. You have to fundraise for it. You have to do the community outreach. And, and of course I said, well, okay, sure. I'll do it, why not? Um, so we did, we got the, the with Honey and Heart had to be formed uh, as a nonprofit so that we could receive funds to do it. And we removed the turf and then we did sheet mulching. So putting cardboard and a la thick layer of, of compost, I mean of mulch to eradicate that grass because that grass has been there for 40 years. So to get rid of that grass is difficult without using any chemicals. So we left that for about six to eight months during the dry time. And then when it started raining, then we brought the plants. And we got a lot of community neighbors, you know, people to come out and help us. We got some plants donated and we planted the whole thing. And it was pretty exciting to see it and to do it. And this is how it looks. You know, right now it's a little bit dry because it's a drought again. And, you know, but this is how it looks in the spring when it's like really happening. And, and it was of course really exciting to see that difference, right? And to see like, and I started seeing bees, like every time I would go there, I see birds, I see hummingbirds and I was excited. But then I was like, well, how much has this really impacted? So we hired an entomologist from UC Berkeley to come and help us do the measuring of what is really happening here. Has this really had an impact? Um, so what we were able to find is that we found nine native species of bees. In addition to honeybees and other bees, we have, you know, uh, also found butterflies and wasps and flies. So there was other pollinators, but I thought it was pretty incredible to find nine species of native bees in the middle of this totally built city environment, two main streets with traffic, like lots of wind, you know, there's a Safeway across the street, there's a Whole Foods, it's very, very, very busy. And yet the pollinators were coming. And that to me was a really exciting story to see that if you build it, they will come, they will come. And, and we started then working with the, um, with their scientists to see like, okay, what flowers are they really visiting? What are the ones that are having the most success? How can we do this better? How can we you know, start to improve what we're doing? So this is the, the most attractive plants that we found on each survey. And one of the things that she suggested that we're learning and we're gonna do this on the next meeting that we do is that you do large swaths of one type of plant rather than having a lot of mix because bees as they're flying they're like oh blue 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 okay and they'll go versus if they see like dots of blue or purples and that by the way is their favorite color of flowers blues and purples and um so you want to provide that um from you know the aerial view that they can see something uh the other thing that we found was that because of the sheet mulch the fertility of the soil like increased dramatically. The organic content of the soil from the sheet mulching and from having the, the, the mulch really allowed for that moisture and for the microorganisms to start breaking and to make that soil a lot more organic and alive than the other medians that had the turf that was totally dead, which had very little content, organic content. So our vision is that we can start to do this in a lot of places, that you all start to do this in every place that you have access to. 
your home, your school, your campus, your work, your parents' home, if we all start to transform these little spaces into habitat, then we can start creating this connection, right? All these little dots of little gardens. And as species are traveling across their migration, then at, when they come to cities, they find this like thriving habitat in which they can feed and, and they can continue on their migration. And we start to look at cities as the thriving habitat or pollinators, right? We switch our mentality that we don't have to do anything in the cities because the country's alive. Now we switch it around. It's like the cities are alive and we create those spaces for, um, for pollinators and for all other species, right? Like as we make our cities more alive, it's also better for us, for our children, for everyone. So the landscape architects action plan and this is um, the big one, right? For all of us, what can we do? So a true commitment, like a real true commitment to create healthy habitat on every project that you do. It doesn't matter what the project is. You may think like, eh, it's just a parking lot, whatever. Every project that you do has the potential to be thriving, living habitat. So how do we start doing that, right? One of the things is you rewrite the specs, specifications. Specifications that have use of chemicals, rewrite them. We don't need that. We need to really think about not using chemicals in our landscape because we don't need chemicals in our landscape. Who are we fighting, right? When we're spraying herbicides, who are we fighting? <laughs> it's not needed. I used to think, you know, like, oh, well, dandelions are so bad, they're everywhere. Dandelions are like one of the most rich pollen source for bees in the beginning of the spring. Like they're the first flower to comes out and that's when the bees need it the most because they've been hungry, starved from the winter and then dandelions. And they're amazing, right? They'll grow anywhere. So why, why spray them? They're, they're our friends. So I really want to challenge all of you to start thinking about what are we you know, trying to eradicate and why? And what are the benefits on, on allowing certain species to thrive, right? So the other one that I really, if you remember anything about this lecture today, please remember this. Source your plants from growers that have a commitment to not use any systemic pesticides. This is huge. This is really, really, really huge, right? We get to our project, we do soil samples, we make sure our soil is fertile, we do all the you know, analysis, and then we get plants from someone who's using systemic pesticides. Systemic pesticides are usually applied, in case you don't know, through granules in the soil. The plant absorbs it. So it's systemic because it's in the whole plant. The whole plant has this pesticide. The leaves, the flowers, the pollen, the fruit will have this pesticide. And they have different lifespans, but it can be up to 10 years. So we may think that we're creating a really beautiful habitat and it may, it may look beautiful, but if it comes the plus plants have been um, exposed to systemic pesticides, it's really a disservice that we're doing. And that soil and those pots and those plants also has the systemic pesticide, which will leach to our groundwater. So then it pollutes our waters, our rivers, the places where we play or parks or you know, our gardens or schools. And so we wanna make sure that we're really mindful about this. Where are we getting our plants? So get to know the growers. <coughs> As landscape architects, we're usually detached from that, which we shouldn't be, right? We do our planting plan, it's beautiful. We send it out to the contractor and the contractor buys the plants and then 
and we don't know and that we need to know and we need to say like no you know this is important only by and find out who are the growers within your region that have that commitment and the more that we ask for it the more that it will be available it's just like you know with organic food and these things that the more it may not exist but the more we ask for it the more it will become available so please remember that please remember that as you go in your careers and you design your spaces think about where your plants are coming from right these are these are living beings that we're bringing to our spaces these are living beings that are creating life for other beings so please think about them as that right they're not plant material their life their life right so love your plants <laughs> love your growers give them some love if they're doing it right you know we want to encourage them so the other part is you know collaboration with city agencies and to integrate insect habitat so think about your cities you know any space that's not being um utilized for this, the roads, the power under the power lines, the uh, next to the railroads, the easements, all of these other spaces that are kind of left over in between spaces that are not used for anything else can be transformed into healthy habitat. And those are the base spaces, right? Because no one's going there. So birds can come and feed, no one's gonna bug them, bugs can come, no one's gonna mow it, you know, so these are, Spaces that we might not think about, but they're important. And education, right? Talk to everyone that you know about this. Like really, you know, tell your parents, tell your partner, tell your friends, tell your roommates. This is important. And really just learn to love and appreciate your bugs, like all the bugs in your house, right? When we find a spider, carefully remove it outside. <laughs> It may look scary, but it's not. It doesn't want to hurt you. It wants to live just like us. So when you know, just be mindful. They're they're doing an amazing job for us. And then in general, right, we can start to think about stricter regulations on pesticides and herbicides for our food systems. Being mindful about what we're eating, what we're consuming, what we're putting in our bodies in terms of our food, in terms of, you know, everything that we are exposed to and how those actions have repercussions along the way. Talk to farmers about creating insect habitat, right? We we're talking about this today. And can we have parts of the fields that are hollow so that other things can grow? Having wild edges so that insects can live there year round and have a diversity. Redesigning the farms. Right, I think it's time. We're seeing that the agriculture as it is right now is not really serving us in the best possible way. So can we start thinking as landscape architects? You know, I think there's potential here, redesigning the farms. Uh, and then, you know, just a national and international government collaboration, like across the, the world. How do we really take action on this? How do we really step it up so that we don't lose and more studies, of course, which are urgent, but we can't wait for more studies. It's clear. <laughs> we know, we have the facts, it's happening. And I'm gonna leave you here with some beautiful faces. So you fall in love with these guys. They're really, truly fantastic. They're just magical beings, some close-ups. So become friends with them. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Patricia. That was such an amazing um, and empowering talk. It's really great to see your whole relationship with these creatures and um, how they relate to all of us and all living beings. Um, and so we're gonna take some time to have Patricia answer our questions. 
So for everybody on Zoom, if you want to send um, your questions in the chat box, um, Sam will let me know about them. And um, yeah, why don't we start with some questions from people in the room? You, you said lo love your bugs. And if you have like a spider, you know, carefully. And that there's species are like declining. There's one bug, but I don't know if this, you would conclude this. It's my, the worst bug I don't like. And it, I think it's increasing. It's the mosquito. Is there any, I mean, I know bee stings you, but it has good things. But the mosquito is diseased. Do you know if mosquitoes are valuable and we should not, like them out Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I um, I have a yard. I have a love and hate relationship with my yard sometimes, but I have mostly I have a love. And um, in the years, like past 15 years ago, my cherry tree would blossom, my uh, apple tree would blossom. Then I would go on the need and I would hear that ohm because they were so full of them. But um, they're not there anymore right now. And then you say, build the things and they will come. And so I was wondering if you had like any input. And it seems that there is phases in my yard because I'm really uh, attuned to that because I'm worried about the loss of the bees. My lavender, they're all there. It's beautiful to see them moving from one thing to the other. And um, so that was... Um, that was one question. My other question is, bees and wasps seems to fight. <laughs> and I, I saw that, I see that too in my yard. And I was wondering, I, I'm, I'm really observing a lot of that stuff. So anyway. Yeah, great questions. Um, insects are declining. So if you used to see a lot more and now you see less, it's because there are a lot less. Um, I try to think of how can I provide in, in my garden, right, in my personal garden, I try to think of how can I provide the best environment for them, year-round source of flowers. I know it's different here because you guys have snow. I don't have to deal with that. Um, but the more that I can provide a source of nectar and pollen for them to come, uh, diversity of flowers, uh, drinking, that's a very important part also, um, a drinking fresh water for them to drink with uh, like boulder, like little pebbles or something so they don't drown, so they can land and drink water because they're thirsty also. So providing water for them to come. Um, and maybe talk to your neighbors, right? Make sure they're not spraying because that can impact a lot what's going on in our spaces. So... Yeah, so talk to them and make them aware of this. And then your other question about bees and wasps fighting. Yeah, they fight. I see them outside my hive. There's always wasps, like just waiting, like eating them. And when the drones are um, evicted from the hive, they are, it's vicious. They're eating them all up alive. It's, it's, it's hard to witness. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know what to do. Um. <laughs> okay, we can take a question from Zoom. Oh, okay. We, oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. It was enjoyable and informative. Um, I think you showed in terms of plants, you know, the types, different species and that are pollen rich and bees like uh, and seasonality. So there's something going on all, on all the time. 
any suggestions about composition? Should we have things in big clumps? Should we scatter them around? If we mix all those things, one here, one here, or is it better a clump here, a clump here, a clump somewhere else, some grasses and stuff that's not necessarily pollen rich as part of the habitat? So that was one thing that we learned from the um, study that we did, that clumps are better because the, the more that as the bees flying, if they can see a big patch of color, they'll go to that versus if it's individual species mixed in. I think having other species, even if they're not pollinator friendly, mixed in uh, are good. For example, at the Pollinator Boulevard, we have found that it, it's a very hard site. It's windy, it's trash flowing, there's homeless, there's, I mean, you name it, everything is happening there. And we found, we have, um, one of the strategies was to have a lot of pokey plants intersperse to try to keep, you know, some major homeless encampments from happening there. Uh, and then it also having some plants that will um, provide shade and have um, that will like look good through the drought because right now we're we're trying to not irrigate it in the in the summer and it starts to look really dry and you know some people are like what's going on with this is dead and so you try to find some plants that are going to look good even like very drought tolerant so you intersperse some of those species to make your garden look good for the visual pleasures okay i think i'll do one more question and then we're gonna have um a reception afterwards so you guys can ask patricia all your questions there um but here give it to daniel Thank you, Patricia. Um, my questions are more around um, coming up against uh, regulations and what you were discussing at the end as far as um, advocacy and working with city officials and also school districts. I'm curious, uh, two questions that um, issues that seem really common, one with parks and rec and also schools with spraying herbicides and pesticides. Um, I've been part of some communities where parents have tried to band together and um, protest and advocate. Uh, I'm curious about if you have suggestions on any or advice on any approaches that have been successful. And also with um, the bees, if you've been able to get them into any of the schools, and if so, what are some um, successes around that? I'll start with the second one because it's easier to answer <laughs> than the first one. Uh, yes, but I don't I don't advocate for having any like hives in schools because that would be too complicated. But yes, in creating habitat and inviting the bees to come on their own to be there. But the issue does come up a lot with school projects. You know, I have had meetings with the school district where they're just like the maintenance person's like, no way, no, 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 no bees. They're gonna stung the kids and they're gonna die and we're gonna get sued and we don't want any bees. And so I try to take a breath <laughs> and, and then say, okay, we'll create a habitat for butterflies and hummingbirds only. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no bees um and sometimes that works right and so you yeah it's um it's tricky and you have to just figure out how to talk to them understand their fears and then also just educate them that yes there is the risk that someone may be stung and die and have an anaphylactic shock and die but it's so small, like that risk is so small compared to the benefit and the experience that a kid can have from, from that, like most likely the kid will get stung and will survive and it's gonna be okay and it's great medicine. Um, but you have to learn how to, yeah, just who are you talking to, how to approach it. 
and maybe showing pollinator pictures of butterflies and hummingbirds. That always works. The other question in terms of regulating, I mean, yeah, it's hard. It's, there's so many studies that show that herbicides are carcinogenic. There's so many studies that show that killing the habitat like spraying and killing all the habitat of monarchs is causing that all the monarchs don't have feed to survive and they're dying. There's so much research out there that proves this. There's so much research that, you know, yes, pesticides are killing the bees. Of course, it's, that's what it is. It's what it's made for. It's made to kill insects and pests and, you know, bees fall in that category. Um, so it's a lot about education, really. Like, how do you talk to them about what the implications of this and what, what you know, like, my question is always like, well, what are we trying to eradicate? What is the thing that you're trying to fight? And is that fight worth the damage that you're going to cause? Or what you're trying to fight, it really is a beautiful thing, right? We had this lecture with the city of San Francisco Parks Department, which has an integrated pest management, which is a great example. And I highly recommend you look at them because they have a great example on how to do integrated pest management. But the w talking to one of them, he was saying, you know, we were spraying the lawns to eradicate. And it's like, at the end of the day, what they were trying to eradicate was these beautiful tiny daisies, which is like, the song about, you know, if you're going to San Francisco, wear flowers in your hair, and that's what they're wearing. And it's like, why are we trying to kill these beautiful flowers that provide habitat and look beautiful on the lawn? So you have to really look at what are, and, and make people conscious and aware of that. Like, what what is it really that we're trying to fight? You know, I mentioned the dandelions. And when I learned how incredibly pollen rich source they are it's like well you know they're not so bad they're not so bad they're a beautiful flower they provide a lot of medicine they provide a source of pollen so you have to really wonder what is the the argument for fighting something and of course you know there's the whole spectrum and some may say that you must in order to create space for only natives and but i i just i don't know i'm not a native so i try to make an argument for like well you know there's some species that have a place and help fix the soil and maybe we don't need to damage our environment worst to let this being live so but it's a hard one Okay, thank you. And I know we all have more questions for Patricia. Um, so I'd like to invite you all to come upstairs with us. We're gonna go into the common studio and have refreshments um, supported by the Women in Landscape Architecture. Um, and I'd like to just say another thank you and give Patricia another round of applause.